The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee will now begin. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee for today, October 26th. I'm Lisa Goodman and I'm chairing this committee. As we begin, I'll note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the City Council and City staff as authorized under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The City will be recording and posting this meeting to the City's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public, public and subject to the open meeting law. At this time, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll to clarify that we have a quorum for the committee. Council Member Reich. Here. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Osman. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Here. Chair Goodman. Present. There are four members present. Thank you to the clerk. It looks like I'm having a technology problem on my end, um, but I'm going to try to work through it quickly while we move on. Today's agenda is before us. I'll begin with the consent agenda, which includes um, items three through 10 on the agenda. Item three is the liquor license renewals for October 26th. Then item number four is the commercial property development fund loan for LV properties at 3613 Lake Street. Item five is a small business lending reappropriation. Item number six is a rental dwelling license with conditions at 3215 21st Avenue South. Item number seven is a land conveyance on the development terms with United Properties, the Park and Recreation Board, Excel, for the city owned properties located at the Upper Harbor Terminal. Item eight is setting a public hearing for November 9th with regard to special legislation for our tax increment spending plan. Item nine is setting a public hearing for the 9th for third party delivery services. Item number 10 is appointment of the director of regulatory services. We're setting that public hearing also for November 10, 9th. Are there any discussion items or anything anyone would like to pull off the agenda of those items? I'm, I, I can't look at more than one screen at a time, so I assume there are no questions. We also have a receive and file item. These are the reappointments to the Animal Control Advisory Board and a postponed item, which is number 12. Is there anything anyone would like to pull off the agenda? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on items three through 10, as well as items 11 and 12. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. Those items are approved. With that, we'll move to the public hearing agenda. I'm going to ask Council Member Schrader to chair this first item because my computer has no power and it's about to go dark. So if he could turn around and chair that while I try to figure out my technical difficulties, that would be great. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, so first, what we uh, have on the public hearing, uh, is the passage of an ordinance amending Title 15 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to the fences miscellaneous and adding a new chapter 404 entitled Catalytic Converters to regulate the sale and purchase of catalytic converters. I'll, I'll invite uh, staff to give a presentation. Thank you, Chair Goodman and uh, Vice Chair Schrader. I'll, thank you very much. I was just about to ask for the presentation. So I'm Enrique Velasquez, Manager of Licenses and Consumer Services, presenting an ordinance amendment relating to Title 15, Offenses Miscellaneous, amending to add Chapter 404, Catalytic Converters. Next slide. To start, I'll give some background. Catalytic converters contain three rare metals, platinum, palladium, and rhodium, that are collectively known as the Platinum Metals Group, or PMGs. The catalytic converters contain two honeycomb-shaped chambers, the reduction catalyst and oxidation catalyst. 
The reduction catalyst contains platinum and palladium, which work together to reduce the presence of nitrogen oxide from post-combustion emissions. The oxidation catalyst contains platinum, platinum and rhodium, which work together to eliminate carbon dioxide and any unburned hydrocarbons before exhaust progresses through the remainder of the tailpipe emission system and releases into the atmosphere. So put simply, as a car runs, the catalytic converter turns pollutants into less harmful substances before they exit through the exhaust pipe. This process scrubs the exhaust and helps clean up the air that we breathe. Next slide. Next slide, please. There we are, thank you. So over the past several years, catalytic converter theft has increased by more than 293% nationwide. In Minneapolis, we've witnessed a 10% increase, 10% uh, rise in catalytic converter thefts year over year with 1,157 thefts reported through September 27th compared to 1,045 through the same period in 2020. While vehicles are still able to operate without the presence of a catalytic converter, harmful pollutants will enter the atmosphere, affecting the air quality that we breathe in while going about daily living. Catalytic converter thefts do not emerge in a vacuum. There are several factors, uh, several of them itemized right here, that present themselves, creating enough inducement for bad actors to capitalize on with limited ability to identify, investigate, and follow up on suspected criminal behavior. Catalytic converters are not marked similar to other major motor components. That makes them less traceable than any of the other items. There's an active scrap metal market for detached catalytic converters, which makes them attractive. Buyers are willing to purchase detached catalytic converters, whether as single units or in bulk, with, um, at least previously, with limited scrutiny. Catalytic converters uh, are quickly and easily removable from vehicles, albeit with crude and rudimentary tools. There's an increased demand for and limited supply of the platinum metals group uh, items, which has driven market attraction. And catalytic converters can be sold in bulk without the need to advertise them for sale. So there's an active and willing market looking to uh, purchase them. Next slide. This uh, slide, uh, while illustrative, what this slide really highlights is the increasing demand for the platinum metals group of products. So you can see the platinum currently trades at over $1,000 per ounce. Palladium trading at double that at 2022 per ounce. Rhodium trading at over $14,000 per ounce. So you can see just kind of the, the timeline. I apologize that it's difficult to read the text, but it shows kind of the uh, a five-year trend in how these prices have uh, increased. And you see a peak, especially with respect to rhodium. Earlier this year in, in um, May of 2021, where it reached its peak at just close to $30,000 per ounce, which kind of also reached the climax of when we saw uh, a peak in converter thefts. Uh, not only locally, but also nationwide. So this also kind of supports the increase in the rash of thefts around, around the nation. And significant quantities of these rare metals are required in the manufacture of new catalytic converters. The automotive industry accounts for 80% of the rhodium, 74% of palladium, and 40% of platinum consumed globally. Additionally, OEM manufacturers and aftermarket catalytic converter manufacturers create even greater demand amid rising manufacturing needs to meet the current vehicle market. Uh, demand for these PGMs and replacement catalytic converters has created kind of this cyclical growth and scarcity stemming from the rising converter thefts. So it's kind of creating this duality. Next slide. And what we see here is just kind of the overall general life cycle. The original equipment manufacturers designed catalytic converters to last the life of an automobile. After uh, the mining process, oops, 
if you can go back one slide, thank you. Um, so other than mining for new um, PGMs, those involved in the manufacturing process obtain PGMs through recycling and reclamation efforts of the used catalytic converters. Recycling PGMs is estimated to be significantly less expensive than mining for new metals. Just to give an example, the cost to recover one ounce of platinum from recycling a catalytic converter is 10 times less expensive than mining for the same mass of unrefined platinum. Historically, PGMs are reclaimed from end-of-life vehicles um, and are eventually reused in the man manufacture of new catalytic converters. As a result, there's a continuous demand and market for recycling catalytic converters. These recycled catalytic converters and the PGMs they contain are returned upstream and eventually flow back into this manufacturing process so that there's just this constant demand in reprocessing loop without the need to constantly mine for more when there's a limited, limited supply. When um, catalytic converters are stolen from vehicles, that catalytic converter may be reintroduced into the supply chain at the recycler, the processor, or at the smelter um, entry points with limited detection disrupting the natural order of the life cycle. Next slide. So, although catalytic converter theft is not necessarily new or limited to specific makes or models of automobiles, these have been rare with respect to other major auto, automotive or automobile thefts or, or other major automotive components. Um, the recent rise in value for the PGMs has increased the market for attractiveness for catalytic converters with limited tools in place to combat the rise in thefts. Um, what this translates to is property owners are left to shoulder the burden for ongoing uh, vigilance, prevention, and the cost to become a whole again after they've been made victims of the crime. Some of the methods include, um, as we can see here, marking catalytic converters with the serial numbers. Uh, so we can see an image there of an engraved serial number or vehicle identification number, a safe label solution where you can apply a number and it contains an anti-deterrent or anti-theft mechanism that self-destroys itself while preserving the number on the catalytic converter if somebody tries to remove the label or even other deterrents such as high temperature paint so that others can visibly see that that catalytic converter was painted or marked in some capacity so that whether a thief tries to uh, steal that catalytic converter or downstream when the catalytic converters are then um, taken for sale either as a single unit or in bulk, those that are participating in that transaction can at least see that there is some level of an attempt made to prevent theft from happening. Other things that, that property owners have done to try and prevent theft are installing closed circuit television, um, anti-theft alarms, and parking vehicles in a way that prevents people from gaining access. Um, all it takes is about 30 seconds of work and some crude hand tools to carve out the catalytic converters from underneath the vehicle. Using State Farm's auto claim data, more than $33.7 million in claims were paid out nationwide between July 2020 and July 2021 for repair and replacements due to catalytic converter thefts, compared to slightly less than $9 million over the same time frame in the previous, the previous year. Uh, next slide. So what the uh, proposed ordinance amendment intends to do with the addition of Chapter 404 is to establish a criminal offense for any persons or businesses that either A, sell a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a vehicle, or B, purchase a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a vehicle. Uh, the intent of the ordinance is not to penalize lawful businesses in good standing that purchase these products from licensed auto repair garages. It's an effort to set a penalty against those that are trafficking in stolen merchandise. 
in concert with Minnesota Statute 325E21. In response to the public hearing announcement, we've received three responses um, from the public. Um, three responses from the public hearing announcement, one from a private resident in full support of the ordinance, one from a licensed salvage yard that's opposed to the measure, citing that the amendment will not stop catalytic converter thefts um, from occurring. Further, this respondent is concerned that the state statute preempts the proposed ordinance amendment. The third response was received just this morning and was a petition signed by seven individuals a collective of tow operators, salvage yard operators, auto repair dealers, and similar that oppose the proposed ordinance amendment. The collective position of the uh, petitioners is that their licensed businesses in good standing that transact business with legitimate businesses for the legal sale of used auto parts, including catalytic converters. And the proposed ordinance as it's written presently would exclude them from being able to continue delivering these services and that this portion of the business will shift elsewhere in the metro area with while catalytic converter thefts would continue. Um, the city's position is that the proposed ordinance amendment codifies a criminal penalty should any person or business be found in violation and it's not intended to uh, penalize businesses. It's intended to complement the, the state statute and I believe um, in working with these businesses and working with the respondents to the public hearing announcement. We, we do have a proposed amendment to the amendment. And so at this point, I'll conclude my presentation and I'll uh, yield the floor to Councilmember Johnson, who I believe is uh, in attendance here as well. Okay, uh, Mr. Velasquez, thank you so much for your report. It seems like we're asking our director of licensing and and this area to do a lot and be an expert in a lot of different areas. And I really appreciate all your work on that. I understand Councilmember Johnson is on the call. I'd invite him to speak now, should he would like to do so before we open the public hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And first, I want to uh, thank you and I want to thank our staff, uh, our, our business licensing uh, director, uh, and I want to thank uh, Lee Wolf as well. So Enrique Lee, thank you so much for your work on this. I think you really highlighted uh, the issues at play here. I mean, it's not just a pollution issue and that's certainly part of it, but most specifically, it's an issue that's affecting residents across our city. And my office checked in with the police PIO uh, to understand the numbers. And the numbers we got back were that in 2019, there were 124 reports of catalytic converter theft. This year, there are more than a thousand so far and the year's not over. So nearly tenfold increase. So this is trending in the wrong direction quite substantially. You know, we'd really prefer, uh, and, and I say this as intergovernmental relations Chair, we'd really prefer statewide action on a lot of uh, topics, including this one. Uh, but since we haven't uh, seen as extensive of an effort there, we thought, you know, it's really important for us to address this because for as my colleagues know, when folks have catalytic converters stolen, this has a very substantial impact on residents. I mean, thousands of dollars typically to replace. And part of the problem is that it's so difficult to catch criminals in this. I mean, we've got uh, 1100 plus miles of city streets. And um, even if we had 10 times as many officers out there as we do today, it's so easy for somebody to walk down the street in the middle of the night when nobody's around, slip under a vehicle, quick cut one of these out in 30 seconds and then walk off. And uh, it, simply today being in possession of a catalytic converter without sort of uh, any sort of documentation is in and of itself not uh, against any sort of uh, ordinance or rules. But with the amended version, uh, which, uh, you know, I'd ask the clerk to put on the screen, uh, which I'd recommend to colleagues, it actually would um, provide some tools for law enforcement around that by uh, prohibiting possession of catalytic converters without uh, either being the vehicle owner uh, or having some documentation from the vehicle owner around that. So we think that can help provide tools for law enforcement. And then, you know, to uh, our director's 
point, we, we listened to and worked with uh, scrap metal dealers on this and, and their concerns. And, you know, I think uh, as is in many cases when we work on these ordinances, there may still be uh, disagreement at the end of the day, but we are recommending a change to make it easier um, for them by adding in this section here around or used auto parts dealer in 404.10, which would uh, provide a licensing path as well uh, for those who are legitimate operators out there to be able to continue this work because, you know, we still need to have recycling of these parts. That is important, but we do um, need to take some action here as well. I don't think this is going to solve all the problems around catalytic converters. Uh, there are still going to be operators out there outside of our jurisdiction, but more and more cities uh, are taking action on this. This is actually, uh, this ordinance was inspired by St. Paul and their effort to address this after uh, not seeing enough statewide action or federal action on this. And so I think uh, if we do this here, not only will we have a positive effect in Minneapolis, but also it'll uh, continue to uh, be a part of efforts to address this problem. Um, again, not going to solve everything, but if it helps on the uh, demand side by putting in more stringent requirements that prevent uh, really this market force from happening now, which results in so many of these illegal uh, thefts and really provides a way for folks because of lack of regulation to be able to scrap these converters without um, any sort of uh, significant consequence or or uh, creating loopholes like we see today where people are still able to get away with uh, this illegal activity. Um, you know, that's that's a, a, a win to get something like this in place. And so uh, I really appreciate our our staff who very thoughtfully considered this and the conversations with folks uh, as well in the industry to try to get the right balance. So I, I would encourage our colleagues to support this and um, this amended version of it and I'm interested in the public hearing as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time to speak today. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. I'm going to see if there's any questions for staff with regard to their report or questions for the author, Councilmember Johnson. Seeing none, I'm going to open the public hearing. I see there's one person in queue to speak on this item. This is Craig Greenberg. Mr. Greenberg, you are the only person signed up to speak. If you could keep your remarks to five to 10 minutes, I would appreciate that. Please press star six to unmute. Thank you, can you hear me all right? We can, sir, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good, good afternoon. My name is Craig Greenberg. I'm an attorney with Huffman, Newsom, Crawford, Greenberg and Smith. We do represent Metro Metals Corporation and I am speaking on their behalf today. Uh, Metro is a recycling facility that has operations in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and it is a fully licensed and compliant business. And it has numerous state licenses and numerous uh, city licenses as well. Um, we appreciate Council Members Johnson, Reich, and Goodman working with us on the issue of catalytic converter theft and Council Member Johnson's proposed ordinance before the committee today. Uh, look at Metro does sympathize with this problem. Um, it, it obviously is a problem that's increased, but Metro does not believe that the proposed ordinance is a way to solve this particular issue. Now I will state that our comments are primarily based on the original version of the proposed ordinance. And I have not yet seen the, the redrafted one that was just discussed, um, but we do appreciate committee members looking at certain amendments that would carve out from the breadth of the ordinance, legitimate businesses like Metro and Metro's customers. But the, still the proposed ordinance uh, we believe would, would preclude Metro and its legitimate customers from, from continuing legal and necessary business within the city. So on that basis, we do, propose, uh, we do oppose the proposed ordinance for sev several reasons, which I will discuss. Um, number one, Metro's customers are primarily legitimate businesses. These businesses include licensed repair shops, parts dealers, and to a large degree, tow truck operators. 
these licensed businesses are not involved in illegal activities and do not buy and sell stolen cal catalytic converters. All the transactions in which Metro processes uh, when it purchases a converter are tracked in accordance with Minnesota law, MinStat 325E.21, which is referenced in the ordinance. If, if you look at the requirements of that statute, and I heard reference to uh, limited scrutiny, it's kind of the reverse. There's great scrutiny placed on these transactions, video taken, uh, record keeping uh, that is extensive, so that there's uh, records of each and every transaction that could be traced by law enforcement. The, the business customers that Metro has accounts for over 80% of their catalytic converter business. And these, uh, as I indicated, the merchant to merchant transactions are fully tracked and fully allowed by Minnesota law. Um, there was discussion of the uh, kind of the flow of where these materials are going and certainly after purchase, Metro resells uh, the converters in bulk to just a handful of national and international recycling companies. Uh, those companies extract the precious, precious metals such as rhodium, platinum, and palladium. And as indicated, the metals are in high demand by manufacturers who can reuse the recycled metals as opposed to relying on mining operations that are damaging to the environment. So there's an environmental component here, both getting the materials uh, out of landfills, et cetera, and also limiting the amount of damage to the environment that is done by mining. We believe that the ordinance here will interfere with lawful commerce. Uh, it will preclude a majority of Metro's customers from lawfully recycling their converters and will ultimately obstruct precious metal recycling that is sound environmental practice. Apart from the business to business customers, Metro does on occasion purchase a converter from an individual. But again, uh, kind of the reverse of limited scrutiny, those transactions are fully vetted, full information, video, license plate numbers, driver's license information, all of that is tracked as required already under Minnesota Statute 325E. Um, there is great effort put into making sure that the seller has title to the vehicle from which the converter came. And they will sometimes even, uh, if, if someone's replaced their converter, they will look under the vehicle to make sure there's a new one in place. So uh, there's great scrutiny given, into, given to those individual transactions as well. When it comes to uh, suspicious sellers, Metro does frequently refuse to purchase and has turned away many suspicious sellers. Those people are ones that cannot prove they have title to the vehicle or that they have authority to sell catalytic converters. And in this regard, Metro has worked with law enforcement on numerous occasions and there are a number of success stories. So Metro and others like it are part of the solution here, not, not the problem. Uh, the, the, the ordinance is also one that, uh, that only tracks uh, transactions within the bounds of the city. And this problem is one that goes well beyond the city of Minneapolis. I think we all agree on that. This is a statewide, nationwide, and, and worldwide problem. And that's all because of, as discussed, the limited supply of precious metals is driving this theft uh, everywhere. Uh, but programs which do nothing more than target legitimate business operations will just push the criminals and other uh, similar transactions out of the city to other cities nearby and further into other unregulated or illegal markets. So a local regulation like this that impacts legitimate business within the city, we, don't, we do not believe will address a statewide and na nationwide problem based on worldwide economics. Um, and then finally, I want to touch on the, the state law preemption issue. Um, Metro's operations and those like Metro are highly regulated when it comes to automobile parts, scrap metals, and related transactions, including the purchase and sale of catalytic converters. Those transactions are already controlled uh, under Minnesota statute section 325E.21. 
Recently, the state legislature did take action. They held several hearings, looked at multiple ways to address the statewide problem of converter theft, and very, very clearly stipulated on what would be required for le legitimate sale or purchase of a catalytic converter within the state. 325E.21 subdivision 1B provides that any person who purchases or receives a catalytic converter must comply with this section. And that is in reference to a very extensive documentation and record keeping requirement. The statute also provides for law enforcement agencies, insurance companies, and scrap metal dealers to work together in this regard. And there was a pilot project put in place to help combat uh, this issue by marking, uh, permanently marking catalytic converters so that they could be traced. But finally, there is a, a definite preemption issue here on a legal basis. Uh, MnSTAT 325E.21 subdivision 10 specifically states, this section preempts and supersedes any local ordinance or rule concerning the same subject matter. Well, this is, you know, great concern to Metro and others like it, that th this legal issue uh, clearly shows that the state legislature wisely wanted to avoid a patchwork of ordinances from one city to the next. Because again, this, this issue is not one that's centered in one city or another. What's really required here, and I think the, the pilot project that was just enacted within 325E, uh, is, is what's required and that's focusing on marking the catalytic converters with unique ID numbers, using labels, engraving techniques, uh, theft deterrence paint, or other methods, you know, ultimately from the auto industry where they permanently mark the converters with serial numbers. I mean, that's something that should be coming sooner than later. And that's where the real solution lies with these, uh, with these issues. So in conclusion, Metro is concerned that the proposed ordinance will prohibit lawful recycling of catalytic converters, force Metro and its customers to shut down operations in the Twin Cities, and really only serve to punish legitimate businesses within the city. Um, as indicated, the state legislature has acted. Uh, they've enacted measures to combat this problem. And the focus here should be on the pilot project that can be found at MnSTAT 325E.21 subdivision 2B. Now, ultimately, Met Metro uh, sympathizes with the problem, but it wants to continue to be part of the solution here. And the proposed ordinance, at least as originally, uh, originally written, would basically block its participation in all respects. So for the foregoing reason, the ordinance, uh, at least as initially drafted, should not be passed. We will obviously look at the amendments, but um, I thank you for your attention to this matter and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. Um, I just wanna verify that there's no one else to speak in the public hearing and then I have a question or two for you and other members of the committee might as well. Um, I'll just check with the clerk to make sure there isn't anyone else here to speak to public hearing item number one. There is no one else to speak, Chair uh, th Thank you to the clerk. I will then go ahead and close the public hearing. Mr. Greenberg, I'm curious about the state law preemption. I understand St. Paul has put an ordinance into place. Have you challenged the St. Paul ordinance? Well, no, um, the timing of this, and we can all check on this, but the timing is the, the St. Paul ordinance actually went into effect in 2020. So this, uh, this amendment to 325E.21 uh, postdated that. So it's as if it was in, in reaction to the St. Paul ordinance. So, but the St. Paul um, ordinance still stands and your it, client hasn't does, done anything about that. So what would lead us to believe that there is a potential problem with preemption if there is an existing ordinance in St. Paul that has been preempted but is still in place? Well, um, that's a challenge that frankly, we would rather work with council and, and try to resolve this issue uh, rather than go the legal route. I mean, I think that's to everyone's benefit. And again, Metro is, is not opposed to reasonable measures. Uh, we wanna be part of the solution, not, not the problem. Um, but 
uh, honestly, that, that's something that is being looked at and can be looked at. And um, but I think plain language is plain language. Uh, and I think the state legislature was pretty clear uh, and the reason for doing that was pretty clear. And we, we've talked with some other folks in the industry who were involved in, uh, in those efforts uh, to, to talk about preemption. Um, you, you've got recyclers who are in, in all, all cities all over the state. So, you know, if you're, if you're a criminal uh, and you steal a converter and you can't sell it in Minneapolis and St. Paul, well, you don't have to go too far. You can go to Maple Grove, you can go to Blaine, you can go to a number of different, you can go across the border into Wisconsin. Um, so we don't believe an ordinance like this is really is really the solution. Okay, um, but so you answered my question about preemption. If 80% yeah. of all of the um, recycling with regard to catalytic, catalytic converters is done, by legal operations that would still leave 20% that potentially could be a question. Isn't that the 20% we're trying to get at, which is people who are not licensed? I mean, if, if you're trying to do the right thing, why would you take any catalytic converters from anyone who is not licensed? There's a number of examples, um, and I can give you one um, that's a typical one. Uh, so if, if someone has an old vehicle, uh, maybe maybe it's close to the end of its useful life. Those catalytic converters do wear out. I mean, in fact, that's why you've got a carve out for uh, auto repair garages because they replace converters for people. Well, sometimes the auto repair garage keeps the converter and then goes to a place like Metro and sells it. Other instances, if the if the car owner knows what they're doing, they may say, you know what, I'm going to take that used part with me and they can go and sell it themselves. So there's an individual who's doing something that's completely legal. They're selling their own converter after it's been replaced, but this ordinance that you're proposing would prohibit that. Well, well it's very it would hard prohibit to do. doing it in Minneapolis. It wouldn't prohibit selling it somewhere else. Well, that is true. That is okay. true. That's the end but, of my but you, you know, some of those some of those people we're talking about may be Minneapolis residents, not they enforcing might. them. To, so okay. you're actually Thank hurting. You. So. Thank you, um, Mr. Greenberg, for your answering my questions. We'll see if anyone else has any questions or uh, chooses to make a motion on this issue. I'm looking at the chat. Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Governor. I don't have any other uh, questions. I just want to thank Councilmember Johnson for his work on this, and I'd be happy to move his amendment to the original um, ordinance. Okay, so um, I think we'll see if anyone else has any questions or comments. If they do not, we will first take up Councilmember Johnson's amendment through Councilmember Schrader, who has moved that. And if there are no further comments or questions, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll on the amendment. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. So the main motion is in front of us as amended, and I would ask that the clerk please be in touch with Mr. Greenberg and the folks at Metro Metals to ensure that they've seen a copy of this amendment, since I'm not sure what the process is when everything is electronic. And I'd ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion as offered by Council Member Schrader. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll next move on to our quasi-judicial public hearings, starting with item number two. This is a variance appeal, RH residential renewal at 4816 Upton Avenue South. I will first ask our staff, Andrew Liska, to please give a presentation. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, the item before you is an appeal of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. The property is located at 4816 Upton Avenue. The property is a single family home. The proposed project started as a building permit for a second story addition. Staff reviewed the project and approved the plan at a 50% demolition. At a 50% demolition, grandfather rights exist, uh, specifically regarding the north interior side yard setback at 3.9 feet. A zoning inspection revealed that in all actuality, this was a 95% demolition. Uh, with the demolition exceeding 60%, no grandfather rights exist and the structure would be analyzed as a new home. The new home largely complies with the zoning code standards aside from that north interior side yard setback at 3.9 feet. Next slide, please. So based on the lot width, the, the new house shall comply with a five foot interior side yard setback here. The applicant sought to reduce that down to 3.9 feet at the Zoning Board of Adjustment. It was also discovered during the um, demolition reveal that an egress window was installed on the north line as well. Uh, an egress would be permitted if that building wall was at five feet. Anything less than five feet would not be permitted. Next slide, please. When analyzing a variance request, three findings must be met. Staff was not able to make all necessary findings and recommended the Board of Adjustment deny this application. Next slide, please. The Board of Adjustment uh, denied this application to reduce that interior side yard setback from five feet to 3.9 feet, and the applicant has appealed that decision of the Board. I'll be here for any questions. The applicant's representative is also on the call. Thank you, Mr. Liska. We'll see if there are any questions for staff on the report on item number two. If there are not, then I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. With this type of hearing, we give the appellant an opportunity to make their case first. I understand a representative of RH Residential is on the call for the homeowner themselves. Um, Brianna Bergstrom, I want to let you know that this would be your time to speak and you have up to 10 minutes if you'd like to make your presentation now. Um, I will note that we've been joined by Council Member Palmisano. So please press star six to unmute if someone from RH Residential or Brianna Bergstrom is on the call. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair Goodman, Council Members. Uh, my name is Brianna Bergstrom. I am an attorney with Taft, Setnius, and Hollister. Uh, we represent RH Residential Renewal, um, which is a sole proprietorship owned and operated by Mr. Randy Hobbs. Um, Mr. Hobbs is also with me here today on the call. Um, so we, in preparation for this appeal, we submitted our statement of appeal and also um, a correspondence yesterday um, outlining our arguments. Um, so I, I would just like to emphasize uh, three reasons why we believe the board's um, denial of this variance request was an error. Um, the first one, as Mr. Liska noted, um, you know, this variance application does meet the three elements that are necessary for a variance. Um, first, the practical difficulties um, that exist in complying with this ordinance are due to the unique circumstances of the property. Um, and these are not due to any fault of the current homeowners. Um, this project was started off as a remodel, um, as Mr. Liska noted, um, partway through the project, residential renewal um, discovered unforeseen previous mold, rot, and damage to the walls um, that was unknown when the project started. Um, at that point, um, Residential Renewal had no other option but to take down these three additional exterior walls as opposed to just the single exterior wall that was supposed to be taken down. Um, and this was due to not only the homeowner's safety concerns um, with the mold and rot and um, walls, 
uh, structure, but also um, neighborhood concerns as well on this property. That is why the um, variance is being sought. Um, the second element is this variance is for a use that is both reasonable um, and keeping within the spirit and intent of the code and ordinance. Um, specifically, City Ordinance 525.520 expressly authorizes a variance to be used to vary the yard requirements, which is what is being sought here. Um, the code also promotes and protects public health, safety, and welfare, excuse me, um, which is why, uh, partly why this variance is being sought, which is also um, depicted in multiple emails that have been sent in by the neighborhood, um, encouraging and um, approving this variance, as well as the Fulton Neighborhood Association. Um, and then the third element, which the CPED staff report actually found that this variance met, which was that the variance will not alter the essential character of the area. Um, the report even stated that the proposed north setback was occupied by the previous structure and utilizing that same location would not alter the essential character of the area or be injurious to health, safety, or welfare of the general public. Um, and I believe that point is important because this variance is being sought so that RH residential can reconstruct these walls in a manner that they were in before, um, before the walls were taken down. This is not a variance that is being sought to, you know, do new construction or anything like that. This is just being sought so that the walls can go back up on the existing foundation. Um, the second reason why we believe the board's denial um, was an error is because we believe that the Board of Zoning Adjustments wasn't provided with uh, certain significant information that may have um, changed their decision. First and foremost, the CPED staff report um, notes, notes that um, Mr. Hobbs and the city planner talked about a percentage of demolition prior to the approval of the project that residential renewal submitted the application above that demolition percentage and then was told to bring it back down for approval, um, which never happened. And we believe this is significant because including that in the report um, attempts to paint the picture that residential renewal always intended for this demolition to exceed 60% when in fact it did not. Um, that was never discussed. That was not the intent of the project. The project was only to take down one wall and then due to the unforeseen circumstances of the mold and rot and uh, wall structure issues, it became uh, taking down the remaining three exterior walls. Um, the CPED staff also withheld, we believe, one of the most important reasons that this variance is being sought, which is the subsequent discovery of the previous mold, rot, and interior. Um, and as Mr. Liska even states in his presentation today, that fact is still not being talked about. And we believe that that's very important for this variance. Um, and then third, we would just reiterate um, in the staff report, all of the neighborhood support and approval of this variance, especially um, from the Fulton Neighborhood Association who submitted a letter saying they don't oppose it. Um, and then the third reason why we believe the, um, why we believe the board's denial, um, not necessarily isn't an error, but we believe this variance has already been automatically approved under Minnesota statute 1599, which sets forth a 60 day timetable um, for an agency to act on a decision. Um, as stated in the CPED staff report, that 60 day timeline began to run. It states on August 17, 2021, um, but we would also state that residential renewal submitted their variance application on August 18th. Um, and there in the staff report, it also states that the end of the 60 day decision period was August, October 16th, which even going off the later date of the middle, August 18th would be October 17th. Um, either way, that time has expired and there has not been a uh, final approval as to final approval or denial of this variance. So therefore it is um, deemed approved. Um, so with that, I will uh, thank you for your time and open the floor for any questions. Um, I don't believe there are any questions for you at this moment. I'm looking to see if there are any. Um, it does not seem like there are. I'm going to now open the hearing to any other member of the public who'd like to speak on this item and see if the clerk has anyone in queue. Um, and then I'll take questions from members of the council. So we'll first just clarify that there are no other speakers in queue. Could you confirm that, Ms. Brock? There are no other speakers in queue, Chair Goodman. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, given that the applicant has had an opportunity to speak as well as to see if there's anyone in the public who is on the call and there are not, I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm sure Council Member Schrader is going to ask the same question that I am, so we'll just get this out of the way easily, which is what is the 60 day timeline, Mr. Liska? The 60 days started on 826. Uh, that would end on 1025, which was yesterday. And an extension was emailed to Mr. Hobbs yesterday, extending this out until um, December 24th. Okay. So um, we are on, on that regard. Okay. Um, I just wanted then to call on Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. You read my mind on the 60 days, uh, but I also want had a question for uh, Ms. Bergstrom. Do you have uh, pictures or photos or, or other proof of uh, the mold in the wall? I mean, it is something that that would be that would be very helpful, uh, but I have yet to see any uh, evidence of that. Council Schrader, thank you. Um, yes, we submitted, I believe, at least eight or nine images in our statement of appeal. Um, and you can see plainly on both the front exterior of the house and the inside, um, the mold, the rotting and the uh, wall structure damage. Thank you. And did uh, your client reach back out to see, but this is something that happens. You never know what's in the wall till you start building. And usually we get uh, folks connect back up with the city before just destroying a wall, especially when they have a permit to that uh, is very clear that they need to keep that wall. Sure, if I, if I may, um, Randy, Mr. Hobbs is here and he may be able to touch a little bit more on that question. Well, and I think that's the, the, the big question is that there was no, there was no conversation between uh, myself and uh, the zoning or uh, Mr. Wee concerning the demoing of the walls and uh, you know that there was actual a a percentage that I needed to hold on to or anything like that. So, and it was stated in these, in the report that there was, and then we, then the, my attorney went and got 400 pages of information from the city, all the, you know, communication. And there's just, there's nothing in, you know, project docs or anything like that, that where he's telling us that we need to have that, or that we change our plan that he, he they basically have stated Andrew has stated that we uh that he got from Mr. We actually Brad actually stated his Brad and planning I don't know what his last name is uh stated that we told them that they had had me go back and adjust the plan to meet uh the the 60% threshold well that never happened so and we we're still waiting for somebody to show us that information I mean, us, we just wouldn't know that that was even a concern. You know, we, I was doing something, I was asked by a homeowner to uh, take down the walls because they were concerned about their health and safety. And I, and they had family members that, that have OCD, some type of disease, and they were concerned about it. Um, and if okay. I could real quick. Hey, hang on, hang on, uh, ma'am. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sharing the meeting. I'm pretty sure that the question that was asked was answered and the public hearing is closed. So we're not gonna have you add any additional information unless there's a question from a member of the committee. Um, so council member Schrader, was your question asked and answered? Mike. My question was asked and answered. I do have kind of a, a follow up uh, for staff and I, I guess just a comment um, so far on this like that these pictures, it, it does seem like there's a legitimate concern, but the, the issue is um, as, as I see it that the applicant applied for and, and got a permit to build one building and one house and then they seem to have built a different house. You know, uh, when they apply initially applied, they got the benefits of the um, front, the setback on the north side and then want to claim those benefits even though they have destroyed more of that like they have removed more of the house like that's not our process and it's um it's it's unfortunate but it is something that was pretty clear um through the process that, that if there is a new uh building that is being built like you need to honor the setbacks that have been uh, set there and so i just wanted to kind of check back with staff if that's kind of a fair way to be understanding this yeah, so 100%. Um, again, 
when we're looking at a remodel, anything uh, under 60% would have grandfathered rights to the existing setbacks. When we exceed that, that's when it's considered new from zoning and then they would need to meet our current standards. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, Council Member Schrader, Mr. Liska, in lay people's terms, if they had followed the plan they had submitted to the city, they'd be entitled to grandfathering being closer to the property line. But because it was an actual full demolition, for whatever reason, um, they're not entitled to that. They have to get a variance, and the variance needs a practical difficulty. You have to explain why you have to have a different um, setback. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure members of the general public can understand that. Council Member Reich, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question relates to the setback. There's the additional issue with the uh, um, egress window. And would have that been granted by right um, due to grandfathering or would that have been an additional thing that they wouldn't have had um, per said grandfathering? Mr. Liska. Thank you, uh, council member. No, uh, no grandfathered right would exist with that uh, proposed egress well. Um, code is very strict on, on limiting egress wells in interior side yards. Um, for emergency personnel to safely pass by, two feet of clearance from the edge of the well to the lot line is needed. Um, with a building at 3.9 feet, there's just insufficient space there for an egress well. So that would not have been approved if that was shown on any plans the city reviewed. So a problem onto itself. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions for the appellant? Are there any other questions for staff? Okay, um, Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd uh, like to move to deny the appeal. Council Member Schrader is moving to deny the appeal. I, I will note, I just don't see the practical difficulty here. And I think we have to treat everybody the same. And um, I don't know how we would go ahead and grant this appeal when there's not a practical difficulty to be in the side yard and with this window well that wasn't on any plan, unfortunately. Um, and so I, I think um, we might feel bad about the fact that there's mold and we might feel bad that they can't move this faster, but um, we have to have a practical difficulty in order to find for this variance. And I don't see that we've found that. Um, so I concur with Council Member Schrader's statement, ask the um, city attorney to please prepare findings of fact for this as it moves forward to the council meeting. And I would ask that the clerk call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion passes and the appeal is denied. Seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all.